Hello, this is Andy Miller from the Davidson Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm here with you today to bring to you an opportunity to participate in an essay and slideshow contest that is sponsored by the Davidson Soil and Water Conservation District every year for all the sixth graders in Davidson County. The topic for this year's contest is the living soil. So let's get right to it. The topic for both the essay and the slideshow contest is the living soil. And to be sure we're all on the same page, uh, I want to define the difference between a report and an essay. I'm sure you've written reports which are just pr a formal presentation of facts. But with an essay, it's a short piece of writing that deals with a single subject from a personal point of view. Now, you might want to use facts to stimulate thinking, but remember, an essay is from your personal point of view. Here are the rules for the contest. Your essay must display the title, The Living Soil. It must be between 300 to 500 words in length. It must be your own work. Now you can use regular notebook paper or regular printer paper because you can type it or you can handwrite it. We do ask if you handwrite it that you do it in ink. And either way that you do it, we ask that you identify yourself on the back. We'll need your name, your school, your grade, your teacher, and some other information that your, your teachers will help you get down on there. Here's how we will score your essays. The content, what you tell us about the living soul will be 50 points. Your writing style, how you tell us will be 20 points. Organization uh, will be 20 points. And what we're looking for there is a good introduction, a good body, and a good conclusion. And then neatness will be the last 10 points. There are some things that we will take points away for. If it's the incorrect length, that's minus five. If it has the incorrect title or no title, that is minus five. And if it is on the right, incorrect paper size, that's minus two. Now let's move on to the computer design slideshow contest. Or you might think of it as a PowerPoint contest because that's the kind of format that we're looking at. What we're asking you to do is to create a slideshow that has no more than 15 slides of content. You can have fewer slides, but no more than 15 that have content. So the correct order for your slideshow would be to have your slideshow that can include up to 15 slides, then have a blank slide, and then have a slide where you identify yourself. So you really can have a total of 17 slides, but only 15 of those should be your slideshow for the contest. You can use audio, you can use animation, but video is prohibited and slideshows that use video will be disqualified. If you're using animations and sound, your maximum length of video is five minutes. And your, your, uh, your entry will be submitted electronically. And I will give you the address that that will be submitted to. And your teachers also have that as well. I do want to remind you about copyrights. We want you to do slideshows that are created by you and show a fresh new idea. Copyrights are part of the United States laws that protect the authors and creators of materials of that particular kind of expression, but not the ideas themselves. So, for example, you can use cartoon characters in cartoon and comic strip fashion if the ideas are yours. But if your classmates or someone else would recognize those characters as some popular character, then your work is copied from another artist. And that would be violating the copyright. Remember, just use your own ideas 
because your imagination is going to give us the best ideas. Here's how we'll score the slideshow. The message that you get to us about the living soul will be 50 points. How well you do that will be 30 points. If everyone appreciates it, can understand it, that will be 10 points. And then what usually sets the winner apart is how yours is different from everyone else's, or what we call originality. Just like, just like the essay, there are some things we'll take points away for. If you violate a copyright, that will be minus five points. If you exceed the maximum number of slides, that will be minus five points. If you exceed the maximum time limit, that will be minus five points. And if you use videos in your slideshow, that will be a disqualification. So here's how the contest will work from this point on. Your teacher will give you your deadlines and will tell you what you must do. But we're inviting you to, to participate in both contests. We are asking your teachers to select no more than one entry per class from each contest to represent your school. We will pick up your essays on December 8th at the school office. And we ask that you have the slideshows submitted electronically by 5 p.m. on December 8th to, to the email address shown on your screen. We will announce the winners by December the 15th. We'll have a team of judges come in that next week, and then we will announce the winners by the 15th. There are prizes for each contest. If you are the first place winner at your school, you'll receive a trophy. And you will be entered into the county contest. If you're the first place winner at the county contest, you'll receive a plaque and $25. And your teacher will also receive $25 for helping you do such good work. If you win the county contest, your essay, your or your slideshow will be entered into the area contest where you'll be competing with the winners from 12 other counties. They haven't announced the prizes there, but I would expect something like $25 for first place, and they usually award multiple prizes, but they haven't announced that yet. If you win at the area contest, you are entered into the state contest. At the state contest, first place in either contest will receive $200, and the second place winner will receive $100. So those are your prizes, and that's what the, the contest is all about. So let's get right into the meat of this. What is the living soul? Well, to a lot of people, the, the soul is just common and meaningless, and, and a lot of people... Treat it like dirt and call it dirt. But if you, if you study the soil and you understand it, it's a marvelous place. It's a marvelous thing. It's a living space that's home to vibrant life and supports life that lives above it. Without the soil, there would be no us. We wouldn't be here. In return, the soil that supports our lives cannot be taken for granted. We must nurture the soil. Healthy soils promote healthy environments, and healthy environments support our healthy lives. But with the growth of cities and buildings and, and more and more people, fewer and fewer of us come into daily contact with the living soil and those working lands that produce food and fiber, clean water, clean air, wildlife, and beautiful views. We eat the food, we drink the water, we breathe the air, we enjoy the views, but only a few of us get to see that and experience it on a regular basis and really understand what those lands need from us in order to sustain productivity for many generations to come. Your first impression of soil may be that it's pretty solid, but that's misleading. Taking a closer look reveals that the soil under your feet may be as much as half 
open space. And when you look closely at that open space, you'll also find that there are many creatures that call that open space home. If we look at the surface of the soil, we'll, we'll see things like millipedes and beetles that are shredders who break down the organic matter right at the surface of the, of the earth. And also there at the surface, we'll find predators like this ant and another beetle. They feed on the other organisms at or near the surface of the soil. Earthworms are important creatures in the soil as they create tunnels and air and ways for air and water to move down through the soil as they make their burrows and as they carry the organic matter that they eat at the surface and then deposit it later in their excrement down below the surface. Arthropods, like this springtail, are grazers that feed on fungi and release nutrients. Herbivores, like this symphilium, feed on plant roots and can stunt plant growth. With an electron microscope, you can see the bacteria and fungi that live in the soil and give the soil its, uh, a, give a healthy soil its distinctive smell. Nematodes are round worms that feed on fungi and other organisms in the soil, and they are microscopic. We also have protozoa in the soil that work to control the activity of the bacteria there. One of the very amazing things is that one cup of fertile soil may contain as many bacteria as there are people on Earth. It's in our own best interest that we understand what it takes to keep our living soil healthy so that we can do those things. One of the things that we need to do is prevent erosion either by wind or by water. And an easy way to do that is to keep the soil covered with healthy plants like crops, grasses, trees, and shrubs. It's also important that we maintain organic matter in the soil. Everything from dead crop residue to grass clippings to dead trees and animals it's the basic food for every organism that contributes to soil health. Sometimes we have to control plant pests, but we should avoid overuse of crop protection chemicals that could damage beneficial soil organisms. One of the ways to do that is to scout the fields uh, like this good land manager is doing here for the pests that are there. He, then he or she knows what, what he has, what they need to apply, and can choose the safest amounts and the least toxic materials to solve the pest problem. Soil and water conservation practices over the last 80 years have yielded some of the most beautiful and productive landscapes found in the world. It's good to see that people are learning to live with the land in harmony. But the real question is, will that harmony last for another 80 years? You don't have to look back far in American history to find haunting memories of the Dust Bowl during the 1930s when people saw towering clouds of dust rise in Kansas and Oklahoma and spread across the nation. The Dust Bowl was brought on by drought and excessive tillage that left our productive farmlands subject to that dramatic wind erosion. But it also got our attention and the modern conservation movement was begun to ensure that it never happens again. And it has not. But there's still work to be done. With the lessons, though, that are lit, written on the land, 
they can teach us what we need to do to prevent soil erosion that robs our country of its productivity and its wealth. When people work together and determine to find ways to live in harmony with the land and protect and nurture the soil, they can do so. One of the things that we can do to help protect the soil is to use best management practices that you might also hear referred to as BMPs. Best management practices are used for a variety of reasons, things like preventing erosion, improving soil quality, reducing runoff, increasing infiltration, the amount of water that moves into the soil. By doing that, it helps to reduce pollutants. The soil helps to break down a lot of pollutants and help keep our environment cleaner. It, these BMPs also improve habitat for many creatures in our world. And there are simple things that you can do at home, things like using a rain barrel or a cistern to catch the runoff that comes off your roof, and then using that water to water the garden or the yard, or maybe even to wash the car. You can plant a rain garden where the water will be filtered and more of it will infiltrate into the soil and you end up with a beautiful garden to enjoy. You can use a compost pile where you take your organic waste like leaves, grass clippings, and the vegetable waste you have from the food in your house and compost it. It can then be used as a nutrient-rich additive to the soil. Similar to, to compost are mulches and ground covers. Covering the soil and preventing it from eroding is important to the health of the soil. Not only does it prevent erosion, but the mulch and ground covers also help to provide food for those organisms that we talked about earlier that live in the soil. Soil sampling is a key part of taking care of our soil and helping it stay healthy. Uh, soil sampling provides a way for you to know exactly how much fertilizer and exactly how much lime your soil needs to be productive. Uh, by taking the test, sending it to Raleigh, taking the samples and sending them to Raleigh, You'll get back a test report that tells you just what you need to grow those tomatoes that you want in order to keep that grass looking green. We also want to properly irrigate, and that means putting the water on in the right amounts at the right times. We want to properly apply pesticides. And don't apply pesticides near water unless they're labeled for use near water. Apply the right pesticide for the right conditions and apply it safely using all necessary safety equipment. Proper waste disposal of, from pets is also important. In Davidson County, the, the proper way to dispose of pet waste is to collect it in a plastic bag, put that plastic bag in with your regular trash that goes to the landfill. Well, not only do we need to do best management practices around our homes, we need to do best management practices on our farms and our agricultural land. And a lot of them are similar. Things like planting ground covers like grass help to prevent erosion, increase infiltration, and prevent soil runoff. They also provide food for those those organisms that live in the soil. Trees do the same kind of things as grasses as they intercept the, the raindrops and allow them to soak gently into the soil, nourishing the soil and providing the moisture that the organisms that live there need. In some cases, special crops called cover crops are used in agricultural situations. Uh, they're used when a, a crop is being, not a crop that's being grown for uh, monetary purposes is not being grown. 
The cover crop is a way of giving back to the soil and feeding it. In this picture, you see something called crimson clover, which is a leguminous plant that can help add nitrogen, which is a nutrient that plants need. The cover crops grow when things like corn or soybeans aren't growing, and they provide the, those things that keep the soil healthy. How we grow our crops can also have a big impact. Using a method called conservation tillage can help to really improve our soil health and keep it alive. This machine is called a combine and it's harvesting soybeans. Uh, on the right hand side of the, of the screen, the machine is cutting off the plants, pulling it into the machine where it separates the soybeans from the rest of the plant. What you see coming out of the back of the machine that looks like a dust cloud are the plants and the hulls from the soybeans. The soybeans are captured in a hopper on the machine and this plant residue is left on the surface. The next step in no-till planting is to use a no-till planter to put the next crop into the soil. This planter plants the seeds, puts the fertilizer into the soil without disturbing the soil. This is how a no-till planter works. This is one row off an, a no-till planter. The front of it is on the left-hand side, and you see that fluted, we call it a coulter, it looks like a pizza cutter, and that's what it does. It cuts a slice in the soil, opens up a little channel in the soil. Following that, the, right in the middle of the screen is what's called the disc opener. Those, there are usually two discs there that open a little channel, and then you see the tubes on top that drop seed, fertilizer, herbicides, or other uh, necess necessary things into the soil. And that's followed up by on the right hand side of the screen by the press wheel that presses all of that into the soil and closes up the row and gets that seed off to a good start. So when the, the work is done, when the planter's gone through the field, this is what it looks like. You can see the rows where there is some minimal, minimal disturbance from the no-till planter. And if you stick around for a few days and the moisture is right, pretty soon you'll see the new crop growing right up through the old crop. This happens to be corn growing where some small grain residue was left at the surface. We can also rotate our crops to help improve the soil. Growing the same crop year after year depletes the soil and it also leads to diseases and pests. By rotating the, the, soil, the crops that we grow, we can improve the soil and make it more healthy. One of the common rotations that we use here in Davidson County is to plant corn in the springtime. It will grow through the summer and into the early fall when it's harvested. After the harvest of the corn, small grains like wheat, oats, rye, or this happens to be barley, are planted and they will grow from during the fall into the early winter. They'll kind of slow down during the winter and then grow again during the early spring and they'll be harvested along about April or May. After the harvest of the small grain, soybeans will be planted and they will grow during the summer on up until no, November, late October, sometimes into December when they'll be harvested. And then we'll follow that again with corn the next year. So we've grown two crops, or excuse me, three crops in two years, and we're helping to build and maintain a good, healthy soil. Another best management practice is called strip cropping, and that's where you grow two different crops in the same field. And you see that in these fields. The different colored strips are different crops. The dark green is corn. The light golden color is where a mature small green is growing. That strip cropping helps to slow the water down, and it's given an extra advantage in this picture because you see how crooked the rows are. Those are across the hillside, and we call that contour farming. So it slows the water down 
and helps the water infiltrate and keeps the soil in place. Terraces are another way that we help to slow the water down. These are like speed bumps that are placed across fields. You can see these ridges across the field and they're directed so that the, as the water drains to them, they will allow the water to drain to the edge of a field to a safe place to dispose of the water. Uh, terraces can be farmed directly over and this, these have been planted with small greens already and are waiting the small greens to come up. A diversion is very similar to a terrace in that it cuts down the length of the slope, slows the water down, but it allows the water to move a little faster. So it needs some vegetation on it, some grasses to hold it in place. The terraces and the diversions both empty into something called grassed waterways. You can think of these as highways to take the water safely out of the field. This grass waterway is in a cornfield that is strip cropped. The, the, you can, we're looking down the waterway towards the woods and the water will follow the waterway down the slope into the woods without causing erosion. At the edge of the fields, farmers use field borders. They help to filter out the water as it leaves the field, trapping the nutrients and any pollutants that might be coming from the field, and giving the farmer a way to get around the field so he can keep close check on his crops and make sure that everything's good and healthy. Ponds are also used as a way to trap water and slow it down and prevent erosion. And they're often built in places where there used to be gullies. The water already collected there, but the gully let it go on down the slope. By building a pond, which includes an embankment, we can trap that water so the water can be used for irrigation, for livestock water, or maybe even some recreational use. In the western part of our country and in the eastern part of North Carolina on the coastal plains, wind breaks are necessary to prevent wind erosion. If you look at the picture on the wet left hand side of your screen, you'll see that the rows of plants get taller as you move back towards the building you see behind them. This windbreak was developed to protect the farm that's behind it. Windbreaks are often used to protect cropland that would be behind it. This, this formation of plants forces the wind to blow up and takes it away its ability to erode the soil by blowing. Just like at our homes, soil testing is important for farmers, even more so because they use a lot more fertilizer than we do. By doing the soil test, they know the correct amount of nutrients to put to grow the crops that they're trying to grow. That helps also to reduce nutrient runoff, which can be a big source of pollution, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. By putting the right amount of fertilizer there, it helps the farmer produce more and save money by not buying fertilizer that he doesn't need. Putting that fertilizer out is also an important job. And in modern agriculture, there's a practice called precision nutrient management. It all works with computers and satellites and GPS units. This truck that you see the, uh, the gentleman getting into is equipped with a GPS unit and a computer that is, is connected to a satellite. They have done soil testing on the fields that he's about to apply fertilizer to where and the between the computer, the satellite and the GPS equipment in the truck, it can adjust the rate of fertilizer as the farmer drives across the field so that it puts just the right amount of fertilizer in just the right places. Farmers also use integrated pest management, or they refer to it as IPM, to help manage pests on their farms, whether it be things like weeds or bugs or insects. 
they use integrated pest management, which is just a way of taking a look at what you have there and determining the safest way to control what the pest is and to determine whether you even really need to do a treatment for the pest. This farmer uh, is preparing to plant this this field uh, into a, a new crop. So he's spraying to control the weeds that are there before he plants the new crop. It's also important that we manage our grasslands. Cattle will easily overgraze areas if they're left without any control. But as you can see in this picture, there's an electric fence going across right where the cows are lined up. And the cows know that there's fresh new grass that is tasty and just waiting for them across from the fence. So they will keep moving as the farmer moves the fence each day. That helps to spread out their grazing, helps spread out their manure, helps keep the soil healthy, and helps to keep the animals performing well. In the past, many farmers allowed their animals, their livestock to water from streams and ponds. But we've learned that that's not only bad for the streams and the ponds, but it's not as good for the animals. The water quality is not as good. So in the last several years, we've encouraged farmers to build fences along their creeks and along their ponds or other water sources to keep the livestock out. We call that livestock exclusion. That allows the stream to try and heal back up. It also helps to improve the water quality in the stream. Well, if we've moved the cows away from the other water sources, we have to create a new water source for them. And what you see in this picture is a new kind of ball watering tank. The dark blue tank is a watering tank that's supplied by an underground water line that's pressurized. The cows quickly learn to come up, take their nose, push the little red balls on either side down where they can get a good cool drink of clean, fresh water that helps them to stay healthy and helps to keep the water clean and our soil growing productively. Around those waterers, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of feet, a lot of hooves. So we use something called heavy use protection in those areas uh, and that's basically either concrete or a gravel pad around the waters so that the cows have good solid footing to walk up on and they won't create those muddy messes that you can often see in the winter time around here modern agriculture has has progressed to the point where they put a lot of animals in a small space and when you do that you put a lot of animal waste in a small space this is a picture inside of a hog house and if you look at the floor down the middle you'll see the stripes that go on either side those are actually slots or slats in the floor where the waste from the hogs their urine or their manure falls through onto a concrete floor that's underneath that floor is flush with water just like you flush a toilet a couple of times a day and the water goes out into a waste storage facility. This happens to be a lagoon for a chicken operation where the, the floors are washed down daily. This lagoon captures the water and helps to break down the waste, helps to deal with some of the odors from it, but it stores it as a fertilizer that can be applied to the fields to provide nutrients for the crops to grow. Well, not all waste is liquid. Many of the poultry barns that you see in our county, the long silver buildings that you see, the waste that those animals produce is dry. And for that waste, we put in what are called waste dry stacks. It's a place where the waste from the, the chicken barns can be collected. It's piled up in these, these dry stack facilities until it's time to put the litter out where it can become a nutrient for the next crop to grow. 
Properly applying those wastes, whether they're liquids or solids, is very important. This is a, a tanker applying liquid animal manure to a field. Uh, but for that to be done properly, the soil has to be tested so that we know what nutrients are needed. And the waste also has to be tested so we know what nutrients are in the waste. That way the farmer can match the nutrients in the waste to the nutrient needs of the soil before he plants his crop. It's also important to note that when they apply this waste, they apply it such that it, none of it leaves the field. It all stays in the field. Construction sites have some of their own best management practices. One of the real common ones is something called silt fencing. Here you see a silt fence and the purpose of that fence is to allow water to pass through while trapping the soil particles behind it so that cleaner water moves to the stream, the lake, or the river, or whatever body of water that's close by. We also use something called sediment basins, which are basically leaky ponds. They're, they are built so that the water comes to the sediment basin. And if you can barely see it in the picture there, but that pipe has lots of little holes in it that allows the water to seep through, but it traps the soil particles in behind. We call that sediment. That's what you can see to the left of where the pipe is sticking up. So those sediment basins trap sediment and allow cleaner water to go downstream. Well, just as plants are important around our homes or on our farms, they're important on construction sites too. So you will see very often on construction sites, just as soon as the work is done, that the workers will go in and apply seed and fertilizer and then cover it with mulch like straw to cover the soil and protect it until the new grasses, the new plants can grow up and protect the construction site. In some cases, we use special plants. The plants you see here on the road bank, other than the pine trees, is a plant called Ceresia lespidiza. It's a plant that is a lagoon that can actually take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil where it can be used as a fertilizer for that particular plant. These are deep-rooted, tough plants that will grow in places where many other plants cannot grow. In some cases, the water moves so fast and there's so much of it that we have to armor the soil. And in this case, what has happened is this stream bank has been armored with rock riprap. These are stones that are probably the size of your head to a little bit larger. That have been The bank has been shaped. The riprap has been placed on the bank to hold the soil in place and to allow the creek to continue to flow by without washing away the bank. That can also be done in ditch bottoms where we have very high velocities, fast flowing water in the, in the, in the ditches after a storm. The rock riprap will hold in place, keep the soil from eroding, and allow cleaner water to go on down to our streams. There are even special best management practices that are designed to benefit wildlife. One of those is something called a riparian buffer. And a riparian buffer is just an edge along a body of water. It could be a stream, it could be a river, it could be a lake, it could be a pond that is protected and allowed to grow up in, in native plants that can provide food for the, the animals that live in the stream and that can filter out the water that comes from above it. This picture shows a pasture, so the, the water from the pasture is filtered out before it gets to the stream. It could be a crop field, it could be a housing development, but the wildlife use these riparian buffers as places to hide, to rest, and as ways to travel. It's hard to believe it, but managed fire can also be a very good thing when we're trying to manage our soil for wildlife. But it is a managed fire. It's small fires that we call a prescribed burn that go through to kill the undesirable vegetation that in this case is growing underneath these loblolly pines. 
the fire releases the nutrients in the soil for the organisms that live in the soil and very quickly after these fires you will see the a lot of new stuff sprouting back up and the wildlife absolutely love it because there's a lot of fresh browse there for them to to feed on it's also important in forests to maintain openings. Those openings are important for the various animals that utilize the forest to have a place to, to, to fly in and land, a place to get insects, a, a place for all kinds of other activities. So openings are important in the forest. In some cases, there are places where additional food is needed to support or to promote wildlife in an area. Different plants are chosen that can provide food or shelter, and, we, and when it's mostly for food, we call them food plots, things like clover. Uh, a lot of the grains can be planted, some shrubs, and they can feed animals from deer like you see on the left hand side to the pheasant that you see hiding down on the bottom on the right hand side. Those food plots help to keep the, the soil covered and they help to keep those organisms that live in the soil going on strong for the future. In the forest it's also important to leave dead trees and especially standing dead trees. We call those snags because those snags will be the place where many kinds of insects live and things like this red-headed woodpecker can go there to get the insects that they need to, to feed on. They can also provide hollows for things like squirrels and raccoons to live in. So those, those dead trees that are left standing in the forest sometime can be an important part of the habitat. When they fall, they decay and become part of the soil and are an important food source within the soil. Well, with all the development that's going on, whether it's clearing land to make fields or build housing developments, wildlife have trouble moving from place to place safely. If you can look at these, these big open patches and imagine if you were a cottontail rabbit trying to cross one of those fields and a hawk was circling around, that would not be a safe place for you to be. But if you look next to the stream, there's one of those riparian buffers that can be used by the animals as a travel corridor. And you see some of the rows of trees between the field. Those provide travel corridors which give safety to those small animals as they move during their daily cycles. Wetlands are a very important kind of soil that we haven't talked about yet. Wetlands are just what they sound like, wet land. And they provide home for all kinds of wildlife and all kinds of organisms, both at the surface and under the surface. So it's important to maintain those wetlands. One of the things, or a couple of the things that they do is they provide flood control. They also help to provide, to re-nourish uh, groundwater during dry periods. And they are just really, really productive areas for many, many different kinds of animals. So as you, we look at all these things we've talked about today, the bottom line is, is that good conservation protects our soil and water for the future. It keeps that living soil living and it keeps it healthy. Back in the 1930s, when the Dust Bowl was so prominent, the president made a speech to the nation about it, and he said that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. That president was Franklin Roosevelt. It's important for us to remember that even today, that living soil is important for us to keep living. So I hope you'll do what you can to keep the soil healthy, and I wish you good luck on your essay or your presentation, your slideshow. Good luck, and I hope to see some of you at the end of the year to provide you the cash prize for being the winner.
Thank you for your time and have a good rest of your day.